This is the tenth video in my YouTube series about net cage salmon farming in Scotland and it takes a radically different approach from the others. Instead of presenting the facts as I and many others see them individually, I list all of the problems caused by salmon farming, presenting them, 15 of them anyway, as challenges to proponents of the industry to justify their contrary claims. In particular, these challenges are aimed at the Scottish Government, its regulatory agencies and local planning authorities, all of whom approve the existence and expansion of an industry that is demonstrably detrimental to Scottish seas, vital ecosystems abroad, indigenous peoples and even the fishes they farm. These authorities claim to have so-called green intentions, but when it comes to salmon aquaculture, those are manifestly contravened by their policies and actions. Here are the 15 problems with salmon farming, which during this presentation will become my 15 challenges. Each is supported by evidence or reference to sources of evidence. Responses are expected to stand on equivalent evidential foundations. If my claims are competently refuted, I will retire from campaigning against salmon farming, certainly as it is currently conducted in nets at sea. Nine of the 15 would be eliminated by the implementation of a single mitigation measure. Abolish the nets. The trouble with nets is that they're full of holes, portals for a distressing array of evils both in and out. To put it mildly, the aquaculture industry won't like it if nets are banned, but Scottish marine and freshwater ecosystems will be grateful at every level. Up portcullis so you can briefly examine the list again. I'll print it in the notes below the video. Now, on to the 15 challenges, one by one. Challenges 1 and 2. Pollution. A standard salmon farm consists of 12 120 metre circumference cages or pens made of netting. All fish waste simply passes through the holes in the nets to accumulate on the seabed or if in solution, wash away in the water. But of course, always in the increasing and accumulating quantity. Challenge 1. Pollution by solid waste. Every year a standard salmon farm deposits in the region of 1,000 tonnes of solid waste onto the seabed, smothering everything living there in a deep layer of anoxic, toxic fish shit. With at least 200 active salmon farms, every year in excess of 200,000 tonnes of solid waste is dumped onto seabeds around Western Scotland and its isles. Although that is currently permitted by the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, SEPA, we think that is a bad idea, don't you? How do we get hold of those figures? By referring to the industry's own data and the Scottish Government's information site, Scotland's Aquaculture. Here's what the seabed looks like beneath salmon farms, filmed by Diver and our colleague in salmon aquaculture reform campaigning, David Ainsley. And what we found on the seabed was this white stuff here is called Begiatoa mat. It's a bacterial mat, um, looks a bit like yoghurt, which is indicative of a very unhealthy seabed. Um, an awful lot of the animals that live in the seabed have died, and so the seabed's gone black and anoxic um, and really um, can only support um, what's been called manure worms. Um, so this is this is another farm. This is well away from the farm, and on three farms that I've dived on, in fact every farm I've dived on, we found the same. We found unhealthy seabeds, um, and the surprising thing is that the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency are supposed to monitor and regulate the biomass of these salmon farms to keep the seabeds healthy. Challenge two. Pollution by waste in solution. Fishes urinate, so pollutants in solution also emerge through the holes in the nets, increasing normal nutrient concentrations. Ammonia, nitrate, nitrite and phosphates all contribute to enrichment of seawater, which alters ecosystem structure invariably for the worse. The resulting condition is known as eutrophication, literally meaning well-fed or overfed more like. Many species are sensitive to eutrophication, sometimes highly visible as algal blooms, or if not, as in the almost imperceptible retreat and disappearance of eelgrass meadows. 
Here's some of the evidence. At the turn of the millennium, an important review paper was published, Scotland's Secret, Aquaculture, Nutrient Pollution, Eutrophication and Toxic Blooms. Referring to salmon farms, Malcolm McGarvin wrote, This report indicates for the first time the full extent of nutrient pollution from Scottish aquaculture. This year, some 7,500 tonnes of nitrogen, comparable to the annual sewage inputs of some 3.2 million people, and 1,240 tonnes of phosphorus, comparable to that of 9.4 million people. Back then, Scotland's population was 5.1 million, and that was 21 years ago, since when aquaculture has expanded with a significantly greater pollution potential. He continues... This obviously presents risks in what are relatively pristine waters. Nutrients stimulate plant growth. It is known from other parts of Europe that they may affect important highland and island habitats such as seaweed forests and eelgrass meadows, where the cloudiness of the water resulting from increased phytoplankton and the proliferation of epiphytes on the surface of these larger plants reduces the depth to which forests and meadows can grow. Here are just two of many peer-reviewed papers describing the detrimental impacts of marine eutrophication on ecologically important eelgrass meadows. In the first, we are told that chronic exposure to nitrate-enriched waters is directly lethal to eelgrass, even at low enrichment levels, causing the species and the habitat it creates to disappear. In the second, we are assured that once lost, eelgrass meadows are unlikely to become reinstated. Back to McGarvin, who continues, The major economic threat comes from the proliferation of toxic blooms. Evidence has accumulated, especially in the last few years, that increases in nutrients and the distortion of nutrient ratios result in an increased risk from toxic blooms, both in their frequency of occurrence and their geographic extent. Harmful algal blooms, known as HABs, are becoming more and more frequent it's difficult to prove they're caused by salmon farming, though the circumstantial evidence for that is very persuasive. To quote from this UNESCO judgment, the harm caused by HABs rises in step with growth of the aquaculture industry. Latest, 25th of October 2021. Maybe we thought that was all that eutrophication could cause. This recent news suggests that increased nutrients emanating from, or indeed concentrating within salmon farms could have ever more unsuspected ecological impacts. After all, sugarcane farming in Queensland, Australia has been shown to be indirectly but surely killing corals of the Great Barrier Reef. Hydrozoans aren't jellyfish, though they are related. They're pretty small and it seems some hydrozoan species can infest the gills of farmed salmon to their extreme detriment. It will be interesting to see what comes out of this conference and whether, if the infestations are identified as being fish farm caused, that is acknowledged by the industry or euphemised as a mere, as they frequently call their failures, challenge. Challenge 3, with challenge returned to its dictionary meaning, pesticides and other therapeutic chemicals, often viciously toxic yet euphemistically referred to as medicines, are routinely applied to salmon farm cages in attempts to control sea lice and diseases. Actually in the cages, might we be mistaken if we presumed that after treatment these toxins are simply allowed to leak out of the cages, disposed of in the sea? I understand that is the case. Do they become rapidly diluted to extinction and can, therefore, be fairly considered to constitute no environmental threat? I doubt it. Sea lice are sinister parasites that eat farmed salmon alive, feeding on surface mucus, skin and flesh, snouts, fins and eyes. One of these sea lice remedies, emamectin benzoate, is administered in feed pellets. In order to reach the skin and be devoured by grazing lice, it must surely migrate from the fish's gut to the skin and therefore suffuse the entire fish. That might have implications. Would it be unreasonable to speculate that residues of emamectin benzoate might be present in salmon fillets on the fishmonger's slab to be ingested by unsuspecting consumers? Should we be asking if farmed salmon is safe to eat? If so, that constitutes yet another reason not to eat the stuff. And there are plenty of us who just don't. Challenge 4. 
Pests and diseases lead a merry life in places where animals, or plants for that matter, are kept confined in large numbers, and salmon farms are no exception. Sea lice are probably the salmon farmer's worst nightmare, but some of the many problematical diseases that affect farmed salmon can wipe out a whole production cycle. Importantly, the fishes suffer terribly and mortality rates, to be discussed later, are beyond belief. Therefore, fish welfare, indeed sheer mass cruelty, concerns us greatly. At every fish farm secretly filmed by activists, horrific scenes of injury, sickness, pain and death are usual. Challenge 5. Impacts on wild salmon and related fishes. Pests and diseases emanate from salmon farms, infesting and infecting wild salmon and sea trout. A number of factors might be responsible for their populations crashing, but fish farm generated sea lice and diseases have been implicated in countless research studies. The industry can do nothing better than deny the science. So that's what their representatives do. Scott, are lice from your farms killing wild salmon? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it, but um, there's no empirical evidence to suggest that that's the case. No empirical evidence? Several specialists have conducted research into interactions between farmed and wild salmon and have demonstrated that sea lice populations boom in fish farms, escape and infest wild salmon, causing their populations to crash. This is now beyond controversy, yet the controversy is allowed to continue for the convenience of the aquaculture industry. The Kirkushek Lab in Toronto has, over the past 15 years, published 59 research papers about sea lice and salmon, probably more since I took the trouble to count them, and there are many more from other workers and agencies. Unsubstantiated denials, such as Scott Lansborough's when interviewed by Tom Heap, just don't stand up to scrutiny. Scott, are lice from your farms killing wild salmon? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it, but um, there's no empirical evidence to suggest that that's the case. So he wouldn't say so. Science does. Marine Scotland has always contributed to research by publishing wild salmon catch data. It is demonstrably not the best research, but here is the most recent, which, if correct, shows an alarming trend. Indeed, I think there can be little doubt that something is killing the wild salmon, even if the causes are multifarious and difficult to resolve. This graph, which ought to have been plotted as a regression, clearly shows a trajectory towards extinction, which definitely needs action, not a corporate shrug. However, at long last, this year 2021, Marine Scotland has acknowledged that there is a link between salmon farm generated sea lice infestations and declining wild salmon populations. It's such a significant statement that I'll read out the main conclusion. Section 6 Conclusions The body of scientific information indicates that there is a risk that sea lice from aquaculture facilities negatively affect populations of salmon and sea trout on the west coast of Scotland. Risks can be mitigated by reducing sea lice on farms or locating farms in areas that reduce interactions with wild salmonids. I suggest that that last bit isn't an invitation to salmon farmers to keep pumping toxins into Scottish sea lochs and not necessarily that they should move their cages out to sea when closed containment tank systems could replace their nets. That conclusion is a very welcome statement of fact, but it's not news. Just a cursory literature search found papers in top scientific journals that exposed the problem, even specified in their titles, from as long ago as 2005. And these are just four out of a huge number of studies. Sorry, Scott. Your answer was, how shall I put it, a blatant terminological inexactitude. Apart from hollow denials of the scientific literature, I think there has been only one published attempt to disprove the link between salmon farm generated sea lice and their detrimental impacts on wild salmonid populations. This. Challenge 6. Escapes. Storms and other forms of damage to cages frequently result in mass escapes from salmon farms, 
always problematical, not only for the farmers, but also for the wild cousins of their fishes. If they have the strength to survive outside their home farm, remember they've spent their entire lives cooped up in pens, farm salmon will breed with wild salmon. Offspring are unlikely to be fit for the rigours of the vigorous migratory salmon lifestyle. The gene pool has been contaminated. To press the point that escapes are far from unusual, here are just three recent escape announcements. What happens to escaped salmon? For a while the industry has been saying, don't worry, they can't survive out in the wild. But they do. A new study by Marine Scotland, the Scottish Government, has discovered that some, or many, do survive and they breed with wild salmon, disrupting their genetic integrity. Sea lice plus genetic introgression means serious trouble for wild salmon. The report concludes, Signs of introgression of genetic material of Norwegian aquaculture strains into Scottish wild salmon populations were concentrated in areas of marine aquaculture production and freshwater smolt rearing the red, orange and yellow dots. Outside these areas, little or no genetic changes were detected. The green dots. The report continues. A conservative approach was adopted to minimise the chance that wild fish were incorrectly classified as hybrids. The result of the analysis should thus be viewed as a minimum estimate of the levels of introgression in the sample of fish obtained across the country. So the situation is probably much worse than is shown by this study. With non-native genes now embedded in the numerous and widespread wild salmon populations, there they will stay until weeded out by natural selection, though some may have qualities that enable them to remain. Return to some sort of normal will take time, but while salmon farming continues, business as usual, the risk of further genetic pollution is unlikely to go away. As with the previously featured welcome but quite obviously long-delayed Marine Scotland revelation about sea lice wild salmon interactions, this is hardly news. Research by the Rivers and Fisheries Trust, RAFTS, begun way back in 2011, found that Across all sites, 369 out of 1,472 individuals, 25.1%, were identified as hybrids that is, hybrids of Scottish native and Norwegian farmed salmon, which is significantly higher than that seen for the East Coast wild baseline. So a significant level of genetic introgression had already been confirmed 10 years previously. One campaigner recently made the wry observation, The industry has accepted that it's going to be fined for escapes without a murmur. I bet they knew about this evidence some time ago too. As well as all the other problems with salmon farming in Scotland, this situation is utterly unacceptable. Challenge 7. The welfare of farmed salmon. Net cage salmon farming is just another form of confinement and battery farming, of which the public increasingly disapprove. Some courageous campaigners have taken to filming inside the fish farm cages with horrifying revelations and animal welfare groups such as Compassion in World Farming, One Kind and others, not conspicuously the RSPCA, have added salmon farming to the cruel practices against which they campaign. Why? The pictures speak for themselves. Challenge 8. Mortalities. Everywhere in the world where there are salmon farms, pests and diseases are rife and increasing. It is not exaggerating to say that some have reached pandemic proportions. 
All the industry can do is clear out the dead and moribund fishes, administer more chemicals, deploy alternative pest control measures and hope to have some sort of reasonable harvest. But the situation simply gets worse. Here is a table of mortality figures for 2020. The average exceeds 20%. That's a fifth of total production with the worst recorded being a shocking 78.3% at Grieg Seafoods Farm in Loch Snizort on the Isle of Skye. Note that number three on the list, with 41.5% mortalities in 2020, the Scottish Salmon Company at Strom, not Strom as it's written here, has been matched this September with another mass mortality event, and they're happening all along the Scottish coast. It gets worse and worse. Last August I found a new Loch Carron viewpoint on a glorious day. Pity about the blemish right in the middle of the picture, but then that's what I'd come to photograph. I returned a week later to discover some pretty frantic activity going on at the fish farm. I had only my suspicion until I saw a report by Don Staniford of a dawn visit he made to film inside the cages. In his text, he observed that this was the worst incident he had seen after some 25 filming and photographing visits to fish farms. No wonder the Scottish Salmon Company was so active, removing all the dead and unsaleable fish. It will be interesting to see if they exceed their own record of 2020 of 41.5% mortalities. September the 6th, 2021. There's dead fish, decay and death everywhere. Here's just one more ludicrous situation. This salmon cage is just a few yards from the Loch Carron Marine Protected Area. This recent fish farm extension was approved after the protected area had been designated for the emergency protection of seabed biodiversity. Did the Highland Council planners have their brains shut down when they approved it? The pale bare patch behind the head of this dreadfully sick fish is a favourite feeding area for sea lice, though they're not over fussy and will nibble any part of the body, including the fins. Note the ragged dorsal fin. Also note that, is it every fish in this film clip that has the death crown? This suggests to me that they're very likely to exceed last year's 41.5%. Several bold photographers have recorded the fate of dead salmon. Here in the Outer Hebrides, they have simply been shunted into sand dunes. Popular with herring gulls and hooded crows, I expect. At other sites, they are transferred to skip-carrying lorries to be transported to rendering factories in the south. Final destination and end product uncertain. The stench as the dead salmon pass by here one of the many stinking trucks passing my home, or after a not uncommon mishap like this, is terrible. Challenge 9. Impacts on wild animals. As wasps pester picnickers, hungry animals are attracted to captive and especially injured and moribund salmon. Plentiful in fish farms. Birds are excluded quite successfully with top nets, but seals attack from below, hoping to catch a feast. Some farmers respond with seal-proof nets, while others resort to underwater acoustic deterrent devices, ADDs. These emit sounds supposed to deter seals. If that doesn't work, they shoot them. But other marine mammals, whose lives are governed by underwater sounds, notably whales and dolphins, which are all protected, are distressed by ADDs. Some farmers carry on using them. Challenge 10 fish fed to fishes. Salmon feed pellets contain a variety of ingredients including fish oil and fish meal. These ingredients are prepared in factories far away from the fish farms off the coasts of Peru and West Africa. Oily fishes, notably anchovy, are fished by fleets of trawlers and ships equipped with fish hoovering nozzles which totally disregard the conservation of their quarry. This resource is bound to run out but do the fishermen or the manufacturers of salmon feed care? Do the salmon farmers in Scotland care? And when we get to challenge 11 and then challenge 14, it just gets worse and worse. And then there's the problem with ethoxyquin. You can read about that. Oily fishes are being exploited to extinction, so a new source of omega-3 oil has been sought. 
Attention has now turned to the very foundation of Antarctic marine food webs, krill. They say it's a sustainable resource. Well, they would, wouldn't they? They always say that before initiating another extinction event. This is nothing short of potentially catastrophic, but do they care? More to the point, do proponents of salmon farming even question this prediction? Don't they see beyond their profiteering blinkers and notice the link between what they're doing and what they're being warned about by people like David Attenborough? It's clear enough. Challenge 11. Soya for salmon feed. Here we go again. As the salmon farming industry expands, so does its appetite for soya meal, at present around 25% of every feed pellet. In order to grow soya, producers, mainly big businesses, simply take over fresh land, eliminating native vegetation or replacing local agriculture. We'll consider the impacts on local people in Challenge 14. It's pretty horrible. Accreditation procedures for responsible sourcing and traceability for soya are in place, boasted by salmon farming and feed companies, but not implemented with the rigour we would expect. This dangerous situation is described in detail by Richard Flanagan in his book Toxic. Challenge 12. Irregularities in planning applications and permissions. You're unlikely to hear about this outrage other than from the Scottish Salmon Think Tank. During 2012 to 2015, South Sky was targeted with four applications to site salmon farms in Loch Slappin and Loch Eshort. The community successfully objected and one of our arguments was that the applicants were cheating. We found lots of errors, poor biology, incompetence and just plain lies and exposed them. Is this common practice across the industry? We will know only if people scrutinise planning applications the way our team did. Here are a few examples. Let's consider first seabed surveys. It's important to know what lives on the seabed in case it's vulnerable to fish farm waste. Spoiler, no matter where and of what ecological quality, it is always obliterated under a deep layer of toxic fish shit. As a biologist myself with experience of marine ecology, I spotted dozens of misspellings and glaring examples of biological incompetence, indeed just plain ignorance, in environmental impact assessment reports. Then, the practical work presented as evidence was often slapdash or just plain useless. For instance, filming by underwater camera on a sledge. Just to show the contents of one of my seabed video folders shows this, even without viewing the actual footage. What do these on first sight murky films show us? Surprise, surprise. Murkiness and little else. Compare this example with wildlife documentaries you've seen. It's beyond awful, but footage like this was routinely accepted by the authorities, even though the water was so turbid as to make everything that needed to be seen invisible, with the camera leaping, diving, gyrating and crashing, disturbing clouds of sediment. Where's the biology? It was made up. Prepare for a rocky ride. The rest of their practical work was also incompetent. So incompetent as to be beyond belief. To characterise the seabed at the site of a proposed salmon farm, the camera must survey three transects, the ideal locations of which are shown here, T1, T2 and T3. The applicant's report confessed that the transects had not exactly travelled as proposed. We wondered why and tracking the routes the sledge took using latitude and longitude readings on the screen, we plotted them. On the first attempt, we plotted only five or six points per transect, but even they revealed the true pattern. All it needed was to line up a ruler between the end points of the transect, and it was obvious that that was precisely what the reporter had done, to make a very wonky survey seem a little less incompetent than they had confessed. Caught out! For the next we analysed, we took a lot more location readings. Even the proposed transect trajectories had been incorrectly drawn, but the reported were a lot worse and still considered fit for submission. Again, our tracking confirmed their locations, the blue dots, and also confirmed that joining the endpoints with the ruler was usual practice. 
But what about the concentration of dots in Transect 2? Here the video showed that the camera sledge was ducking and diving wildly, crashing and spinning. At one point it bumped into a Longustine fisherman's creel they didn't foresee. They had so little control that the mounted camera wandered back and forth, yet still they submitted this nonsense as scientific evidence, unashamed. Caught out again. Film and plotted transects were accepted by Scottish Natural Heritage, now Nature Scott, with the comment, The surveyed transects were not as straight as portrayed in the supporting information. The visual survey footage is not of high quality. The footage is fuzzy and the camera is seldom stationary. Why didn't they reject it out of hand? Because, as I was once told in a quiet corner, they had been instructed not to impede the aquaculture industry's progress. And Scottish Natural Heritage is our official statutory regulator, supposedly the protector of Scotland's wildlife. There's quite a lot more to say about irregularities in planning procedure, not only on the part of applicants, but also the planning authorities. Read about it in holes and an appraisal available as a PDF download at the Scottish Salmon Think Tank's website. It's all pretty hair-raising, and we must keep exposing it as best we can. Challenge 13. Non-implementation of a legal obligation, the precautionary principle. In environmental science and politics, the precautionary principle is embedded in international law, formally as Principle 15 in the United Nations Declaration on Environment and Development or the Rio Declaration of 1992, which states, Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. The precautionary principle may be a matter of international law, yet in Scotland and elsewhere it is rarely implemented and contraventions such as this lot, perpetrated by salmon farming, just pass unchallenged. If Principle 15 is a little difficult to understand, the online Encyclopaedia Britannica provides a user-friendly paraphrase. The precautionary principle requires that if there is a strong suspicion that a certain activity may have environmentally harmful consequences, it is better to control that activity now rather than to wait for incontrovertible scientific evidence. With salmon farming, incontrovertible evidence of environmentally harmful consequences is something we have in abundance. 15 or maybe more. So an appropriate response would seem to be, well, rather obvious. Actually, the precautionary principle is a matter of day-to-day -day common sense, and we use it all the time. Yes, just plain common sense. Common sense plus a modicum of awareness and forward planning. In 2018, the Scottish Parliament embarked upon a major inquiry into salmon aquaculture. It consisted of a scientific study, appraisal by the Environment and Rural Economy Committees, and a parliamentary debate. During the Environment Committee's hearing, the convener, Graham Day MSP, asked the panel... Can any of you or all of you point to examples where the growth of the sector has been influenced by the precautionary principle? John Aitchison, Friends of the Sound of Jura. Interesting hearing uh, Professor Fuspo when you asked him that question on behalf of that whole panel, having reviewed all the scientific evidence that he squirmed around and said, there's been a, um, an attempt to work together historically. That was it. That was the precautionary principle as enunciated to this committee. That was really poor. It's not been applied. Later in his report, Mr Day commented, over that period, there appears to have been too little focus on the application of the precautionary principle in the development and expansion of the sector. And his conclusions included the unequivocal, the status quo is not an option. First, a strong recommendation that the precautionary principle must be the basis of the Scottish Government's support for salmon farming, and then, finally, an axiom that was echoed time and again as the inquiry progressed through Parliament, and there's no harm in saying it over and again. The status quo is not an option. That status quo includes the authorities habitually failing to apply the precautionary principle to all of these environmentally harmful consequences of salmon farming as currently conducted in nets at sea. 
The inquiry and Parliament were both in agreement that the status quo is not an option. Therefore, surely the status quo is not optional. But three years later, it looks like it still is. Scotland continues to contravene international law and disregard its own agreed and publicly broadcast edict that the status quo is not an option. Challenge 14. Profit before people. I'm shocked to have to discuss this outrage. It shouldn't happen. If salmon farming in nets at sea were not bad enough, it has deplorable impacts on innocent people thousands of miles away on the coasts of South America and West Africa. The fleets of trawlers that remove entire shoals of small oily fishes from tropical seas without a care for the ecological consequences deprive local people who rely on fish as a staple of that very food source either by reducing availability or excluding them from their traditional fishing grounds. Likewise, land grabs for soya growing exclude local farmers. Salmon farming companies boast about the advantages they bring to coastal communities by providing jobs. In Scotland, that means just a few jobs for each farm. Overseas, where fish meal is produced and soya grown to supply the industry that provides those jobs, very many more people not only lose their employment in fishing or farming, they lose their entire livelihoods. And in places where fish oil and fish meal are produced, their health thanks to massive pollution of their seas, land and the air they breathe. I'm afraid, in my opinion, employment for a few in Scotland and widespread suffering of innocent people in Peru, Chile, Senegal, Gambia, etc. are not equivalent. The greed and depravity of the salmon farming industry seems boundless. Two shocking documentaries show just how awful that situation has become. I'll put the links in the notes below this video. Challenge 15. Weak regulation. The Scottish Government has three statutory regulatory authorities tasked with controlling salmon farming and protecting the Scottish marine environment. Those two duties are directly related to and interactive with one another. During my time campaigning for salmon aquaculture reform, it has seemed to me that all three authorities lack the power to enforce the regulations for which they are responsible and which we, the public, expect of them. Although there are regulations of a sort, SEPA permits too much salmon waste and toxic therapeutant chemical directly into the sea with demonstrable detrimental impacts on marine ecosystems. There are aquaculture reform campaigners far better qualified than me to expand on this topic, and maybe before long they will. Research by Marine Scotland Science has proved to be of quite low calibre, sometimes awful. I know this because I've been engaged to do some checking. Not only that, but Marine Scotland response to published science that doesn't suit the aquaculture industry has sometimes frustratingly been delayed for many years. In the case of the interaction of fish farm generated sea lice and wild salmon declines, up to 16 years, and genetic introgression caused by escapes, eight years after the first published research. During those delays, of course, although the problems were widely appreciated, except by the Scottish Government, there was zero meaningful response to those serious problems. For many years, backpedalling by SNH, now Nature Scott, has been evident from their statutory consultee responses to salmon farm planning applications, which they submit to local council planning committees. They habitually accept as tolerable all except the most severe ecological environmental impacts, and the councils make their decisions accordingly. This specimen paragraph is almost a pro forma response, which I interpret to mean the proposed salmon farm will, of course, cause ecological damage, but it doesn't matter very much. This proposal will primarily impact upon an area of burrowed mud, which is a priority marine feature habitat. The quality of the video survey footage is very poor. However, given the generally uniform nature of the habitat, it is possible for us to make an assessment of the significance of impacts arising from this proposal. In this instance, we consider that any impacts on burrowed mud will not raise any issues of national interest. 
That sort of assessment seems to apply to all instances of the burrowed mud habitat, which is not only a priority marine feature, but also the main habitat of longoustine prawns, the focus of an important inshore fishery routinely evicted to make way for salmon farms. That seems a bit cockeyed. <laughs> Robbing Andy to pay Anders. The Highland Council's planning committee, most members of which know precious little about the subject, assumes that its statutory consultee's advice is sound, correct and unbiased, which in my opinion is, shall we say, a serious shortcoming in the planning process. Right, you proponents of salmon farming in the way it's currently being inflicted on Scotland's coastal seas, I've provided 14 good reasons why one more, the precautionary principle, should at least be considered, and that's an understatement, and a parliamentary inquiry has stated unequivocally that it should be. So with reference to my 15 challenges, what evidence can you bring to the discussion that contradicts all of the evidence that I've just presented? These are the sorts of questions you need to ask yourself and then to answer, not with indignant reposts, but with authority. Here are the 15 summarised. Challenges 1 and 2. Pollution. Outputs of solid and dissolved waste are routinely quantified, so we know those as facts. So the question is, do those outputs have detrimental impacts on the marine environment into which they are being jettisoned? Do they constitute pollution? Challenge 3. Chemotherapeutants. Application of a suite of toxic chemicals is routine. Therefore, what detrimental impacts do they impose on the ecological stability of the sea where they are applied and disposed of? Challenge 4. Pests and diseases. Pests and diseases are an increasingly serious problem in salmon farms where they harm the fishes and lead to greatly reduced productivity. The severity of infestations is a direct consequence of intensive farming, so can they truly be controlled or should alternative farming methods be introduced? Challenge 5. Impacts on wild salmonids. In the light of comprehensive research, is it possible any longer to deny that there is a causal link between salmon farm generated sea lice and severe declines in wild salmon populations? Challenge 6. Escapes and consequent genetic introgression. In the light of recent Scottish Government research, is it possible any longer to deny the significant proportions of the tens of thousands of salmon that escape more than occasionally from fish farms, contaminate the unique gene pools of wild salmon populations, and that it matters? Challenge 7. Sheer cruelty. Does widespread and severe injury and disease in salmon farm cages constitute cruelty? Challenge 8. Mortalities. Are the increasing mortalities of fish farm salmon acceptable to the salmon producers, the concerned public, or the captive salmon? Challenge 9. Impacts on wild animals. Should innocent animals in the sea outside the salmon farms be victimised because of their natural instincts or obliged to suffer the potentially life-threatening agonies of acoustic deterrent devices? Challenge 10. Fish fed to fishes. The evidence I have is anecdotal, from books I've read and YouTube videos I've seen. They're shocking, but are they true? Can you deny or defend the overfishing of other people's food and harm to their health caused by uninvited foreigners' desire to eat an inferior version of a fish that used to be a luxury? Challenge 11. Soya fed to fishes. Can you defend widespread clearance of forest and traditional farms to make space to grow vast acreages of soya bean, which also leads to the abuse and eviction of local people? Challenge 12. Irregularities in planning procedure. Here's just one more lie from a fish farm planning application. I think in this case it was a mistake, but quite a big one, and considering the importance of the document, which contained other, air quotes, mistakes, it was also incompetence. We found far too many of these sorts of mistakes in planning applications. Challenge 13. Non-implementation of the precautionary principle. Why should the aquaculture industry and the regulatory authorities not be more careful about what they do that is more than likely to cause environmental harm, particularly when international law says they should? We don't need to be reminded to apply the precautionary approach to everyday life, 
so why allow them to ignore it when it's likely to interfere with their accumulation of profit or inconvenience them a little in their work? On the precautionary principle, um, I have to say, speaking as a planner, I don't like it. Um, I don't like it as an approach because I think we're actually paid to take decisions and those decisions, in my case, obviously are are we recommending approval or are we recommending refusal for definite, clear, evidenced reasons um, and not because we're not sure. So we don't feel like taking a decision. Blimey. So that's why the precautionary principle doesn't get implemented. The very people who should be applying it don't like it. It gets in their way. So let the marine environment go hang. Maybe you can tell that I'm not terribly impressed by this excuse. Challenge 14. Profit before people. Can you defend overfishing to supply fish meal and fish oil factories, plus widespread clearance of forests and traditional farms grabbing land to grow vast acreages of the soya bean? Both industries, preparing feed for farm salmon that the developed world wishes to enjoy, cause deprivation, sickness and eviction of innocent people in less developed countries. Are we prepared to put up with that? And challenge 15. Weak regulation. Do the statutory authorities tasked by the Scottish Government to regulate salmon farming in Scotland and protect Scotland's natural environment do what is necessary to protect Scotland's marine ecosystems from pollution, intoxication and the ecological declines that salmon farming causes? If not, why not? So, challenge number 16. Can you honestly show me to be wrong? If you can, I'll save myself a lot of time and energy when I stop continuously banging this campaign drum, burn my book, holes, bin my essays, take down the Scottish Salmon Think Tank website and delete forever all of my laboriously produced YouTube videos. Simply put, tell me I'm wrong and I'll shut up. But you'll have to do better than ignore me or blithely deny my evidence-based contention that salmon farming, as currently conducted in nets in the sea, is a dangerous industry, and you'll need to respond intelligently to my 13 challenges. There are a lot more people than me who want to hear your answers. I've spent an awful lot of my later life on this campaign, and I don't want any more of it if it's going to be pointless arguing against bigoted assertions, unsubstantiated denials and vacuous indignation. Frankly, I'm fed up with it. This isn't the way I intended to spend my retirement. Just present me with evidence that will convince me that for almost 10 years I've been barking up the wrong tree. But if you haven't got any, please do whatever you can to end net cage salmon farming. And don't force me to waste any more of my precious time on this filthy, heartless, greedy, invasive, polluting, ecocidal, dangerous, money-grabbing industry.